Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. For the very latest on the COVID-19, we take you to the urgency room. So we're coming to you from the urgency room in Egan with talking with Dr. Christy Trusso about the rapid COVID test. So thank you for being with us. And Thanks so much. Apologize for the mask, but this is good to be this protection. And stay and safe, that. right. So um, for, um, for our viewers, again, what is the rapid COVID test? So we're doing, so the rapid COVID testing is a, uh, it's a molecular based test that we are able to do in you know, 15 to 20 minutes. So the patient would know the result of the test before they left the urgency room. And that's offered at all three of your urgency rooms? In Correct, the yes, we're doing testing at all three sites. Now, do you need an appointment? Can you walk in for that? So we are doing, we are, anyone can walk in and be assessed for the need to have a COVID test. Uh, the rapid testing is predominantly being scheduled through our website online, um, and that's to, uh, that's to help folks manage their testing time and manage, uh, manage the appointment. And who should be coming in, whether they have symptoms, no symptoms, and again, what are the symptoms that you're seeing? So you know, the most common COVID symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath. Um, there are less common symptoms like diarrhea, uh, loss of taste and smell is very specific for COVID, but not everyone has that. Uh, we are, for our rapid testing, uh, we, are, we are testing uh, anyone who needs a test for any reason, whether it be symptomatic, asymptomatic, school, entrance, travel, all of those things. For our folks who are coming into the UR, we're really, uh, for uh, evaluation for symptoms, we're really focusing on that symptomatic crowd. And I would think it might be getting confusing with the fall allergies coming in and stuff. I've heard a number of people getting stuffed up in it, but it's more chest than nasal, or is it both? That you're well, seeing? you know, COVID can have a very wide variety of symptoms, from very mild to very severe. I would say that if you're experiencing that fall allergy feel, you just need to ask yourself, you know, is this different than what it's been in the past? Is this my usual fall, watery eyes, itchy throat, or is this something different? Do I feel different? Uh, you know, always erring on the side of being careful and cautious about going out and exposure uh, for others if you're having those symptoms. And if something does seem different, it does warrant a test. Yeah, and especially if they're having shortness of breath. Correct, Absolutely. yep, shortness of breath is a little bit different than just your typical fall. Uh, allergy congestion. And now on your positivity rate, what kind of um, numbers are you seeing? And, and also the, the type of people coming in, we're hearing more college students now are being testing positive. What are you seeing here in the East Metro and Twin Cities? So the, the statewide positivity rate at this point is right around 5%. We're, we see groups and families that, count, that are coming in. So ours has ranged as high as 10%, but sometimes we're testing you know, numerous people within the same family with that close exposure. So that does drive up our positivity rate. We don't really track the demographics of our patients that are testing positive. That's more done through the, through the Department of Health. And are you seeing um, people that have been at family gatherings and things that are coming in with potential symptoms or yeah, concerns? Yeah, it's really a wide range of exposures. Some people have no known exposure. Some people it's a family gathering. Some people it's a sports gathering. But it's really not, We, like I said, the Department of Health really tracks that. But from what we've been seeing at the urgency room, it's not, it's not one group of people. It's... It's, it's a range. And as we know, schools are opening, parents are concerned, kids are concerned. What advice do you have for them to stay safe when we still have the COVID-19 still spreading here in the Twin Cities and in this part of the country? So I would encourage parents to talk to their schools, be really, be really familiar with the school's guidelines. And then it's a lot of the same really good stuff that we do usually. Stay home if you're sick. That's really the big one. Wash your hands. Uh, we've all, we're all doing you know, good masking and social distancing. Uh, and it's important to maintain that as the, uh, as the school year goes off. But um, that it can be done safely, we believe to go back to school. Go back to school. Student. I think school districts are really making an effort to make sure that students are safe as possible. And then um, right on the heels of all this, we have the flu season coming up. We sure do. And I know some health officials are saying that people at all years, they should get their flu vaccine this year. It is particularly important this year. One of the main concerns from a public health standpoint is how much is COVID going to stress our hospital system, stress our ICU system. Influenza puts a stress on that system every year. So if, if we can really 
widely distribute the flu shot, perhaps we can tamp down the, the stress of the influenza season on the hospital system. And is it too early to get it now here in September or? Flu vaccine is just coming out. I would encourage you to talk with your doctor about when the best time for you to get it. Any other advice for our viewers with COVID-19 still spreading in the Minnesota and around this part of the country and around the country actually? So just, I would just say be cognizant of your symptoms. If, you're, if you feel sick, stay home. That's really the main thing. Uh, otherwise, when going out, do your good masking, social distancing, hand washing, avoid big gatherings, and just use care when, when making your personal choices. And then finally, too, I understand that you have a, an update on the Woodbury Urgency Room. There's a change going on there. What's that? Yes, about? we're very excited to say that we have a new location. Um, it's not far from our uh, it's not far from our current location, just one about one mile down the road. But we will be moving to our new location in Woodbury on October 1st. All right, any final comments for our viewers? Just, uh, we're, uh, it's, we're excited about our new spot, and if you do have uh, concerns about COVID, we'd be happy to do your testing at the urgency room. Well, always a pleasure to have you with us, even with a mask in there, so thank you so much. All right, thanks so much. Thank you, we'll be back with more right after this. Hi, my name is Chris Ayersman, and I'm the Director for Infectious Disease at the Minnesota Department of Health. I know that COVID-19 is on everyone's minds. Slowing the spread of COVID-19 is vital for protecting our communities. Right now, it is important for people to cancel large gatherings and practice social distancing. And what this means is making sure that you're maintaining a distance of about six feet between people. Continue washing your hands, covering your cough, and cleaning frequently touched surfaces. Stay home when you're sick. I'll say that again stay home when you're sick. That is the most important thing. We know these recommendations mean disruption to your lives, but they are so important. We need to slow the spread of the virus so that we don't overwhelm our hospitals and clinics. Thank you for doing your part. If we work together, we can manage this situation. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. During COVID-19, job losses, school closures, and social isolation has left many families without enough food to put on their table. Local food shelves say they're, they're seeing record numbers of families in need of food. Joining us to talk about this, we're glad to have Jessica Francis with the Christian Cupboard Emergency Food Shelf being with us. So located on the East Metro side of the Twin Cities. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Tell us a little bit about the Christian Cupboard Emergency Food Shelf, or CCEFS. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a mouthful, but um, Christian Covered Emergency Food Shelf, or CCEFS. Um, we've been around since 1983. Um, and so we were formed by uh, a group of churches um, in the 80s to, to help fight the hunger that was in, in Woodbury at the time. And as the Woodbury community grew, um, so did our food shelf. And so um, we, the organization grew and added on programs and eventually began to outgrow the space that they had had at, at Woodbury Lutheran Church for many, many years. Um, so in 2018, we moved to Oakdale um, and we've been in Oakdale at this new location for only a few years, um, but it's, it's done amazing things for us um, in our ability to really expand the service that we've been providing. And I've been in there and it, it looks just like a grocery store mm -hmm. and there's shelves with lots of food and lots of fresh fruits and produ uh, produce and meat and things like that. So um, what are the kinds of things that you do offer to families? Yeah, so at our, through our regular food market program, which is um, offered on Mondays, Thursdays and Fridays, uh, we are providing those, those basic um, food items such as cereal, uh, vegetable oil, um, a lot of a lot of the basic items that you use to cook your meals, in addition to milk, pro fresh produce, meat, um, dairy, deli items, etc. And then um, some of the basic household items like toilet paper, um, paper towels, laundry detergent, items like that. Those seem like they've been in demand even more than ever before. Right, absolutely. You just don't think about things like that. Right, you know? Th those are basic needs as well. You know, toothpaste, toothbrushes, those are, those are really basic needs. So normal operations and then COVID-19 hit. What has happened? How has it changed operations? How has it changed for people that are in need of the food? 
Well, uh, absolutely everything changed um, in March, just like it changed for every other place in our community, really, and it, um, um, it changed at our food shelf. And so now all of our services are provided as drive-up service, um, completely contactless. So people now drive up um, through our driveway and um, they'll have an, an intake volunteer that comes up to the to car side and asks just a few simple questions um, and to, so that we can have our, our records for that visit. Um, and then they pop their trunk and we put food in their vehicle. Um, it's really the entire process is designed um, to keep our volunteers safe, to keep the people that are coming to us safe, um, and to make it as, as quick um, and and easy to, easy to access this uh, this food during a pandemic. And you were telling me um, uh, previously that your numbers have skyrocketed. What are what are you? How many families are you mm -hmm. serving daily, weekly, monthly, that type of thing? And what did you previously? Right. So before COVID, we were serving about four thousand five hundred individuals a month. Um, and so that was um, people that are visiting our regular food market programs, as well as our, our free po produce fairs on Saturdays, our Wild Card Wednesdays. Um, that was about 4,500 um, people a month. Um, last month, we served 17,000 people. Oh my gosh. And um, so it's, it's just changed tremendously. More than half of the people that are coming to us um, since the time of COVID um, have never been to our food shelf before. Um, and so we, we have been able to expand our, um, our services so greatly. In fact, since COVID began, we've now distributed more food just during the pandemic than we distributed in all of last year. Wow. So, so it's, it's made a market change. And the, the, the families that you're seeing, that you're located in Oakdale, where are the families coming from and, and who can use the food shelf? Um, so we serve anyone who comes to us in need of food. Um, and so uh, we believe that it's really important um, to, to serve anybody that um, might need the food, whether or not they have an address within our, our city limits. Um, there are a lot of people that make up our community, um, and they might be people that work in the community. Their children might go to school here. Um, and so um, we, we do serve anybody um, in need regardless of address. However, about two thirds of the households that we serve are either from Oakdale or Woodbury. Um, and then the other third are from um, Maplewood, parts of Maplewood wood that are in our service area, um, Landfall, east side of St. Paul, other surrounding communities that may, that may live or work um, in these communities. So if someone's listening to us and they're thinking, you know, is this something that my family can use? How do they go about signing up? Do they have to make an appointment? I mean, how does that all work? Yeah, we, so we don't require appointments for any of our programs. Um, we try to make it as simple, simple and easy for people to access. Um, so really, uh, you can check our website, www.ccefs.org. Mm -hmm. um, look at our hours and please just drive up during our hours and we'll ask a few simple questions and, and, um, and get them food and, um, and then they can go along with their day. Um, it's really designed um, to be as helpful as we can and, um, and, and make it as, as easy to access so that people can kind of take the, take the food off of the table, so to speak, of, of, uh, of all the other issues that might be pressing in that family. Um, and say, well, okay, if you have fresh fruits and vegetables and, and um, healthy items to cook with, that just relieves so much of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the burden um, uh, that the family might be experiencing so that they can focus on other issues. Yeah, and I would think with schools that were closed until this month, mm -hmm. let's see how that goes, you know, but a lot of the families, the kids, depend on those school lunches and, and the breakfasts that are available too. So that's another need that has, you know, has come about because of COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of, a lot of parents that uh, lost their, their work hours at the same time that their, their kids were home and the kids are home and they're hungry. I mean, I have my own kids. I know how mm -hmm. um, it, you, it feels like you put some food out on the table and then you turn around and then you come back and it's empty. Yeah. Well, if you, um, if you are really struggling and, um, and 
you're uh, you're struggling to find that food to put on the table every day. It just adds um, so much stress and strain to the family. So, we what, what about people that might have um, food allergies and things, or maybe do you have they have a different type of a diet? You know, more a cultural type of a diet. How are you servicing them? Yeah, thank you for asking about that because that is one thing that we've really been trying to increase um, as time has gone on with um, our response to the pandemic. So now when people um, drive through our line, um, we have some pre-packed boxes of food and the fresh produce and milk and other items. Um, but we also have, um, we ask questions like, do you need cat food, dog food, diapers, um, some of those questions. Um, but we also have uh, racks of food that people can choose if they need gluten-free items or um, culturally appropriate foods or other really specialty items that we don't want to put in those pre-packed boxes, mm -hmm. but we want to make available to people. Um, so those are the opportunities that we have that people can add on items that they really need. Now you had mentioned something about the wild card Wednesdays and the produce fair. What are, what are those exactly? Mm -hmm. So Wild Card Wednesday is a, um, a really great program where we um, go out to local grocery stores and we get thousands of pounds um, of food from local grocery stores. And that food is, it, it's towards the end of its life and so the grocery stores are taking it off their shelves but it's still got several day, good days of use in it. Um, and so uh, we collect that food from the local grocery stores and we get it out um, to folks every Wednesday. Um, we usually have between 250 or 300 families that come through our line um, in, in a short period of time on Wednesdays and they, and they get that food um, that's often, um, it's meat and dairy um, and deli items and fresh produce um, and it's really um, high quality food um, that the grocery stores um, literally just took off their shelves that morning. Wow, that's wonderful. That's wonderful and that um, you are able to provide that for all those different families and stuff. What other things should people know about? I mean, I think um, you had mentioned that a lot of people, this is like the first time they've ever been to a mm -hmm. food shelf and um, that it's very welcoming, that people should feel welcome there. It's really important to us that um, our environment is welcoming because we know how difficult it is to ask for help. Um, and it, particularly um, parents, for example, it, it can be really hard um, to say that you're struggling to put food on the table for your family. Um, and so we try to make the entire experience um, welcoming and, and respectful um, so that people can um, receive the, the, the help that they need and know that that, that that food will be available to them whenever they need it. Um, We've, we've heard from people, for example, uh, late last fall we had a gentleman that came in and he said, you know, I've been coming to your food shelf for a month now, but this is the first time I've been able to step through the door. And, and it, was a, it was a good reminder um, to us how he, he pulled up to our food shelf but r required multiple times oh, before wow. he, he felt, you know, that he was able to step through our door and ask for help. We want to make it so that um, everyone knows that they can, they can come and get the food that they need. And you mentioned that you want to keep it safe for your volunteers. You're always in need of volunteers, even more so now with COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. We are in need of volunteers. Um, we have so greatly expanded our programs um, that we, we need more volunteers just to make, um, make that um, happen and, and the additional um, work that's happening every day. Um, but we also have some volunteers that had to stop coming um, because of COVID, uh, because of their own health concerns or health concerns of, for a member of their family. So we are always looking for more volunteers to help fill in those gaps. Um, and going to our website is the best, best way for um, volunteers to, to go and you can fill out a simple form and then look and see what days and times we're looking for volunteers. And you mentioned you get some of the food from the grocery stores and other things, but you're also looking for donations as well to keep those supplies up. Did I read something like for, um, is it like $10 or 
a, a 10 pound, if with a dollar you can feed, get 10 pounds of food or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So those financial donations make such a big impact because um, with the financial donations, we can order that food from the, the nonprofit food banks um, like Second Harvest Heartland and, and the food group. And we can get, um, like you said, 10 pounds of food for every dollar that we spend. That's incredible. Wow. And so uh, your dollars can go very far. Yeah, it makes a big impact for us. And then we're able to get the food that we need the most um, and make sure that we have those items for the people that are coming to our doors. Final comments to our viewers about the, the food shelf and, and um, that you want to leave them with. Well, I, I just think it's, it's incredibly hard um, for people to, to admit that they might be struggling um, to to put food on the table and so I think just letting people know that that it's okay and we're here to help um, and if you want to join us um, in, in in fighting hunger in our local community and you want to help support it um, you can make a donation um, and you can uh, go to our website and look for volunteer opportunities we're really always looking for for ways uh, that we can expand and and be helpful to more people so that's a great way to help well, Jessica, thank you for what you guys are doing in the community. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. A pleasure to have you with us, so thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Thank you. We'll be back with more right after this. I got some Oxy after I hurt my neck. First, I took them to feel better. Then, I just kept taking them. I didn't know they'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. And we're at the urgency room in Egan to talk with Dr. Rob Anderson about IBS. So what exactly is it? Well, first off, thank you for coming here oh. again to Egan. It's thank you for to always having here. us here. Yeah, yeah. our pleasure. So irritable bowel syndrome is a diagnosis of when somebody has abdominal pain and changes in their stool patterns. And that's it. And that's, typic that's it. And it's typically a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning it's important to ensure that you don't have other conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease or IBD, which is commonly confused with IBS. And the difference is inflammatory bowel disease is typically a subset into ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Oh, and those okay. are different conditions that require treatment. So IBS is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you want to make sure that you don't have Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or other conditions like diverticulitis, appendicitis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. okay, I've heard from other family, family and friends saying they thought it was this and then it was this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it does take a lot of investigating to make sure. Does, yeah. So what would be the symptoms that they have IBS and, and sure. what should they do about it? So typically here at the urgency room, when people come in, they're typically coming in with abdominal pain. Um, so we want to do our assessment to determine if they have one of these other conditions first. So we can do blood tests here to look at the liver enzymes to make sure it's not an infected gallbladder. We can do tests to look at the white blood cell count to see if there is possibly a, an infection going on. We can do a CAT scan or an ultrasound as well. So we can do all these, all these tests to determine if you do have a different condition going on. And if you don't, then typically the follow-up is going to be with a gastroenterologist or a GI doctor. And sometimes they might even do a colonoscopy or an endoscopy to look for other conditions, even like H. pylori is a bacteria that can grow in our stomach and can lead to increased acid production and GI upset a lot. Or celiac disease is also where you have a gluten sensitivity um, and you should not have gluten because it can irritate and inflame your bowels. Um, and there's also people who have a, just a plain gluten sensitivity as well and feel like having too much gluten in the diet can cause symptoms that can contribute to IBS. And who's more at risk or the most at risk for developing this? So IBS affects typically on average between 10 to 15 percent of the population and all people are at risk for this. You know, the younger um, adolescents, uh, older adults and everybody in between as well. We're all at risk for developing IBS. Well, it's unusual or what's funny about this is a lot of people actually don't come in to see if they um, have IBS or not because they've just kind of learned to deal with it during their lifetime. They've learned to go from ha being constipated to having diarrhea to constantly having know. this abdominal pain. 
And this can develop at any age or mm -hmm. anything? Or yeah, it can. And can you lose it at any age as well? Or, I mean, do yeah. once you have it, you always have well, it? Well, the goal is, if you are definitively diagnosed with IBS, is to work on different modifications in your diet to help reduce the severity of your symptoms. And when should you go see your primary care mm -hmm. doctor or physician? Yeah, if you're having symptoms on a regular basis, I'd say it's important to follow up with your family doctor. I always say having a really good family doctor to help coordinate your care is so valuable. Um, but if you feel like you're having acute symptoms, we're open here in Egan Badness and Woodbury from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day. And um, your emergency care doctors? Yep, we're emergency medicine physicians. So we're we work half time here and half time in the emergency department. So we're used to handling um, everything that comes into the emergency department. And we we're not an emergency department here, but we have the capabilities to do a lot of what can be done in the emergency department, including the CAT scan, ultrasound, and blood tests. Anything that they can do to treat them themselves at home and things like that. Yeah. So I, I, we typically actually leave that up to the gastroenterologist. Mm -hmm. Our goal of care here is to determine if you have one of these acute life-threatening conditions or something that's going to need surgery. And once we kind of rule those out, we typically refer people back to their family doctor or to their gastroenterologist. And there are different medications that people can go on. There are different diet modifications that people can do to help control their symptoms. Any final advice for our viewers on IBS and what they should yeah. be aware of? You know, one thing that's really helpful is to watch your diet and keep a, a food log. So every time you eat something and if all of a sudden the next day like, oh, I'm feeling a little bit more bloated today or I've been constipated for the past three days, then you can go back in your food log and say, wow, well, I had this food on that day and a month ago I had the same symptoms and I had that same food. And then you can present that to your doctor or to your gastroenterologist and that might help give them a clue um, to help you make, make them a, help them make a diagnosis. Any over-the-counter th um, medication or anything? Sure, that there's lots can... of over-the-counter medications that can be used to treat you know, symptoms of heartburn, of uh, diarrhea, of constipation. But again, if this is an ongoing issue, it's very important to, to see your doctor or gastroenterologist mm -hmm. to see if there is something else going on. And certainly if the symptoms are really significant or if you get a fever, the pain's a lot worse, um, we really want to see those patients to be able to make sure they don't have one of these other significant conditions. Well, yeah. as always, great advice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, that's our program for you. Thanks for joining us. We hope you join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.